What a privilege to be here and well, the opportunity to preach and at the Young Adults Conference. I'm glad to report that the death of old-time religion has been greatly exaggerated. I heard somebody say that it was dead and dying, but evidently not. And I'm glad to see some young people that still want to serve God, uh, still in the old-time way. And just honored to be here and thank the preacher for the opportunity uh, to preach on this Wednesday night. A couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, I guess it was now, I was privileged to preach in a conference at the D.L. Moody Tabernacle in Northampton, Massachusetts. And a uh, huge auditorium and, and just the first night being there, knowing who had stood on that platform, D.L. Moody and, and Sankey and Philip Bliss, and they said that Fanny Crosby had sang there. And just that history behind us, it was just a little bit overwhelming. Anytime I come to this place, knowing the history behind it, who has preached here, I mean, my heroes that have stood in this pulpit in this place, it's always just a little bit overwhelming. But I'm grateful that it's not just history. I'm grateful that we don't, just don't talk about what used to be, but there are some today that still want to carry on and still want to serve God. So it's not just our history, it's our present. And I thank God for that. I want you to take your Bibles and find Exodus chapter 21 with me, if you would. Exodus chapter number 21. And we've been driving all day, as I know most of these young adults have been. And boy, I'm glad this is not a teen conference. I hate teen conferences. <laughs> There's just so much drama with high schoolers. Just, 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 it's just too much, too much. For me. I'm too old for that. But young adults, no drama, no drama at all. Do what you want to. Be your own chaperone. And uh, that's, that's the way I like it. So I'm looking forward to this week and see what the Lord has in store for us. Exodus chapter number 21, I'm going to begin reading in verse 28. Read down to verse number 32 from my text this evening. In Exodus 21 and verse 28, If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die then the ox shall be surely stoned. And his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. But if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past, and it hath been testified to his owner, and he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him. Whether he have gored a son or have gored a daughter, according to this judgment shall it be done unto him. If the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto their master thirty shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. I want to preach tonight for just a few minutes on why the dangerous ox must die. Why the dangerous ox must die. The text that I've read to you sits in the middle of a section of the book of Exodus that is called the book of the covenants. You'll find that phrase in chapter 24 and verse number 7. After God gave Moses the Ten Commandments recorded in chapter 20, He then gave Moses a series of case laws that applies the Ten Commandments to everyday life. Those case laws you'll find in chapter 21, chapter 22, and chapter 23. And I believe the proper way to look at those laws is that they are the application of the Ten Commandments. They're written in different legal language than the Decalogue. The Ten Commandments are general principles. They have a very broad and a very universal application. But case laws are more specific. They speak to a thousand and one different scenarios that come up just in everyday living. And these laws are not meant to be a comprehensive legal code that covers every imaginable or possible situation. They are descriptive. They are representative. Many of them follow an if-then formula. If this happens, then this is the penalty or this is the remedy. For example, the eighth commandment in Exodus 20 and verse 15, thou shalt not steal. That's broad. But you get to chapter 22 and verse 1, if a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. It's the same commandment, but it's an expansion of that commandment. 
Now, now, now we're more specific and there's a penalty for stealing the ox or the sheep and, and for some reason the penalty is different. So we understand that the Ten Commandments give us the fundamentals and this book of the covenant, they apply those general laws to specific circumstances. The Ten Commandments were written in stone. The rest of the law, including these case laws, are not written on stone. They are written on parchment. And I believe that's to demonstrate the, the, the absolute, unchanging, inflexible nature of the Ten Commandments, but case laws may change with societal changes. For example, I don't know if anybody in here owns an ox. And if you don't, you may wonder then how does this law apply to me? And you would be partially right. The principle behind the law certainly applies to us, but the law as a law is not a law that you have to be concerned with, particularly if you don't have an ox. There are some people who call themselves Christian reconstructionists or theonomists, and they say that we should enforce all of these laws and penalties on our own modern justice system. And if you believe that, then you'd be okay with a church-run state or a church state, kind of like the reformers wanted to set up. But, but these laws were never intended for us to set up as specific laws. It was never intended for the United States or any other nation to adopt these specific laws to be the laws of our land. They are illustrative of the principles behind the Ten Commandments. And though you and I are not under the law like an Old Testament Israelite, these laws do reveal the mind and the heart of our God. The law of God reveals the character of God. So while I may not find an exact code of conduct in these laws, I do learn something about my God. One thing that I learn when I look at the law just from a 40,000 foot view is that God is concerned about the public behavior of his people. God cares about how you and I live in society. He does not want us to live in private piety and public immorality. He wants our relationship to him and our obedience to his laws to be lived out in the public arena. It is a contradiction to be pious in here and to be immoral out there. And the laws of God are not just to be kept in the heart. They are to guide us in everyday life. Another thing that I learn about my God, just as a broad view of the law, is that God is concerned about equal justice for everyone. The slave is to be treated with the same justice as the free man. The poor man is to given the, given the same equity as the rich man. The woman is given the same protections as the man. Equal justice under the law, that's a prevailing theme throughout. And if I could just take just a couple of minutes and I'll get to our text in just a second, but if I could just give you a very brief breakdown of the categories of law, if you will just cast your eyes at chapter 21, and we'll not read the verses, but verse 1 through 11, here are laws regarding slavery. Now, there's been a lot of confusion among Bible students about how the Bible views slavery, and there's a lot of questions that I can't answer. I do know that every law in the Old Testament regarding slavery was designed to protect the slave. God's concerned about the rights and the well-being of even the least of his citizens. It's interesting, if you studied the ancient codes of, 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 of the ancient Near East, you would find that, 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 that none of those laws protected the rights of slaves. They, they didn't have any rights, but, but when you come to the Word of God, man, here's the first set of laws, and it's for the slave, and, and God puts their rights right here at the very beginning. There's about 11 ways in the Bible that you could end up becoming a servant to a master in Israel. You could commit a crime and have to pay restitution. You could owe a debt that you couldn't pay off. You could, you, you could simply not be able to support yourself and have to sell yourself into servitude. But whatever the circumstances is, the guiding principle is that the servant is to be retreat, treated with respect and fairness and equity. And then in chapter 21, verse 12 through 17, you have laws regarding capital punishment. There's a some in our society that says that the death penalty is barbaric and that it promotes a culture of death. And there's been a lot of arguments made against it, but God established life for life way back in Genesis chapter 9. And what the death penalty ultimately teaches is not a death culture, but that life is actually precious. When you take someone's life who is created in the image of God, then it's going to cost you your life. 
capital punishment is expanded to even more crimes in these verses. Then you get to verse 18 to verse number 32. And these are laws regarding personal injury. Sometimes something happens through negligence where there is bodily injury but not death. And it doesn't warrant capital punishment, but there has to be restitution of some kind. And so these verses talk about what happens when two men get into a heated argument and one strikes another or when a man, a man injures his servant or, or when a lady that is expecting is, is injured and she loses her child. In fact, you'll find in these verses, and we'll look at this in particular, that you're even responsible for your animals. In the verses I read to you that if an animal gets loose and injures another person, you are responsible for that. And the overarching principle behind this is personal responsibility for your actions. And please understand, it's not an all-inclusive list. It is just representative. And you could come up with a hundred different, different hypotheticals and, and say, what about this and what about that? Th th these, are, these are broad statements that, that's going to cover so many different scenarios. When you come to chapter 21 and verse 33, down through chapter 22 and verse 15, you have laws regarding property rights. There are nine specific situations that are an expansion of that thou shalt not steal. There's the case of a man who digs a pit and another man's animal falls in the pit and dies. Or the case of one man's beast goring another man's beast. There's a case of, of one man's beast running loose in your field to graze. Or the situation where you set a fire in your field and it reaches out to somebody else's field. Or you borrow something from somebody and then it's lost or stolen in your possession. What's the remedy for that? And again, it's personal responsibility. Well, I have come tonight to to what I think is a very fascinating law. It's the case of the dangerous ox. This is what would fall under what we would call animal control laws. We have such ordinances in neighborhoods, leash laws. You can't let your dog run all over the neighborhood being a nuisance or if a dog gets loose and bites a kid, then you may be responsible for that. And in this law, the sanctity of life is upheld because even if an animal takes a human life, then it is treated as a murder. Now quickly step through the law with me and I'll come back to it and I'll give you some principles. But look if you would in verse 28. If an ox gore a man or woman that they die, then the ox shall be surely stoned and his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. This is an agrarian culture and oxen were used to plow fields and other farm related work. And if your ox somehow got loose and, and injured someone and that person died, then that ox has to be put to death. It would be severe to put the owner to death for something that's negligent. It's not intentional. But he still has to suffer the loss of the ox, which would probably be, be useful in farming. It's going to cost him, but, but it's not going to cost him his life. Now somebody says, why, why does the ox have to be killed? Why couldn't you just sell the ox, move the ox somewhere else? Uh, but, but, well, the reason why is because it's contrary to nature for an animal to attack a human because God gave man dominion over beasts all the way back in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. It's an act of rebellion against creation. It is a direct result of the curse. And God teaches us that human life is valuable to the extent that all of creation is to honor it, even an ox. And if a beast goes against God's intent of creation and takes a human life, then that beast is removed from creation. But verse 28 is very specific. It's not just to be killed, but the ox is to be stoned. Well, why does the ox have to be stoned? Well, the verse tells you. It is stoned to keep it from being eaten. The Jew was forbidden to eat meat with blood in it. And by stoning it, there was no bloodletting, meaning that the meat becomes unclean to them. By stoning it and killing it this way, this beast is being treated as an unclean animal. Interesting thing, it's not an unclean animal. It is actually a clean animal, but it's being treated as if its nature has changed and it is now unclean. There is a transformation that has taken place. It is unclean because of its offense. But look at verse 29. But if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past, and hath been testified to his owner, and he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. The circumstances have now changed. Because now the owner of the ox knew that the ox was aggressive. 
He knew that the ox was dangerous. Folks had told him, you better watch this ox, but he does not take strong enough measures to keep that ox contained. He's been warned the ox is dangerous. He kept it anyway, regardless of the risk, and now the ox gets loose, and now the ox kills somebody, and now the ox and the owner have to pay with their life. The principle behind it is that you are responsible for the injuries you cause and for those you didn't cause but could have prevented. When you have a deadly animal and you are negligent to keep it contained, then the law looks at you as a deadly duo. I have a, um, our, our family has a golden doodle dog. Somebody got an idea to cross a poodle and a Golden Retriever, and let's come up with a new breed. It's a mutt. That's what it is. My Golden Doodle Dog is a, it's a sissy dog. It, it truly is. It, if, 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 if we had somebody break into our house at night, my dog would be glad to see him. He would welcome them in. My dog wouldn't know how to bite you. My, my dog had, just, just wouldn't know how. If somebody came over to our house and my dog bit someone, it would be so out of character. It would be so unexpected. It would be so shocking, but it is still my dog. I, I, I would have to pay the doctor bill, maybe some kind of lost wages. However, if I had a pit bull, if I had a Rottweiler, and I had kept this dog on a logging chain all of its life and poked it with a stick for the last two or three years, and this dog is always lunging and growling and snapping and snarling, and you just know if you get close enough, this dog is going to tear you up. If that dog gets loose and injures a child, then my penalty is probably going to be a lot more severe. That dog will have to be put to sleep. I could even face negligent criminal charges, at least a civil lawsuit. That's the situation in verse 29. Well, verse 30. If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he should give for the ransom of his life whatever is laid upon him. Because the death was unintentional, it's not premeditated, God allows for a substitute punishment for this owner. If the surviving family members would allow, they could set a price for restitution and the owner could pay that price as a ransom for his own life. Now, the sin could be covered by either the ransom payment or his death. <laughs> And the price is not open to negotiation. It is whatever the family of the victim demanded. Now, there's gospel all in verse number 30, and I'm going to move right past it because I'm going somewhere. But look at verse number 31. Whether he have gored a son or gored a daughter, according to this judgment shall it be done unto him. If the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto the master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Now, now, there are two different scenarios here. There's no amount of money that could replace a son or daughter, but again, the family could demand a civil penalty and, or he could face death. But if the victim was a slave, then the civil penalty is set. It is set at 30 shekels of silver, which was the price of a slave. And a lot of people have read that and it gave them angst because they think that the slave is being devalued. He's only worth 30 pieces of silver. I think just the opposite. I think that the price is set at 30 shekels of silver to prevent somebody not from paying more, but from paying less because it is a slave. It would be just like man to devalue a slave and God is saying that his life is valuable too and it's not to say that his life is not worth any more than this but his life is not worth any less than this. So, so in this particular case law, there, there's several layers of meaning and application. There's the value of human life, and there's the responsibility that you hold for negligent behavior. There's the value of a servant. There's the law of substitution. But I believe that the application goes even deeper than that. There, there are some lessons that you and I could learn and take out of this building with us and put it into practice. You see, I don't have an ox. So, so how does this particular scenario play out in my life? How, how do I take this and how do I put some teeth to it and how do I put some teeth to it and how, how do I apply this passage to me right now? And I believe that there are three principles that I wish that you'd write down that I believe we can take from this case of the dangerous ox. Here's the first one. The first principle is that which cannot be kept 
must be killed. Now listen carefully. A man owns an ox. That's not a bad thing. In fact, in an agricultural world, an ox would be a very useful animal to own. There is nothing wrong with owning an ox. There is nothing inherently evil with it. You can plow with an ox. You can pull a cart with an ox. There's a lot of things that you can do with an ox. However, in this case, this man's ox has a rebellious streak and has gotten out of the pen on occasion. Not all oxen are dangerous animals, but it becomes apparent that this particular oxen is dangerous to this particular man and he's causing more trouble than what he's worth. And here's the phrase that you need to look at in verse number 30. He hath not kept him in. As long as he can contain the ox, there's not a problem. But he failed to keep the ox contained. He failed to control the ox. And if you have an ox in your life that is dangerous, that you cannot contain, that you cannot control, that you cannot keep in, I may not have a verse in chapter that says it's wrong to have the ox, but the ox has proven himself dangerous, and you better kill the ox before it kills somebody else. You may have a dangerous dog that is kept as a guard dog, but if that dog ever gets loose, you know it is going to hurt someone. And if you are unable, if you're unable to keep that dog in a pen, then you better get rid of that dog. Now, I could put all kinds of names to this principle. I, I really could. I, I could put computer. I could put music. I could put friends. I could put video games. I could put whatever it might be. Things that are not wrong to have in your life. But if it poses a spiritual danger and you cannot contain it, you had best kill it. I'll give you one example, give you just, just to give you one application. You and I live in a digital world and we're not going back to analog. I, young people that grow up, grow up with a gadget in their hand, we call them digital natives. But they grow up with that. If you can't figure out how to do something on your phone, ask a teenager. In fact, ask a preschooler. It doesn't matter. Uh, it is, it is amazing to me that my three-year-old granddaughter that can't spell cat knows how to turn a video on on the phone. That's amazing to me. I, I, I'm right now in the process. I'm in the process, and I've been for a while trying to reduce my digital footprint. I, I, I have Mac and iPad. I have an iPad and phones and what have you, and, and, and I, I'm just trying to, what do I need all of these devices? And, I, and I'm, trying, I'm trying to reduce my, I, I, I hate Google, I hate YouTube, I hate, I hate big tech, I hate censorship, I, I hate all of that. Now listen to me, it is not wrong to own those digital things. I have a laptop, I, I have an iPhone, I have all of those things. I, I would like to get rid of the iPhone, but just because of the privacy, I'm, 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 not, I'm not conspiracy, but I'm, I'm really, really close. <laughs> And I, I don't think it's wrong to own those things. Those things can be very useful. But did you know that good things can become bad things? Did you know that a phone can become addictive? Did you know that video games can be addictive? Did you know that television can be addictive? Don't, don't die on me. I'm not done yet, all right? Help me just a little bit. You, you see, you, see you, you can pull up a lot of sin and a lot of evil on a computer. There's a lot of men, there's a lot of young men that have sat for hours in an office or, an off or a house somewhere and they've stared at pornography until their brain was fried and you can go to chat rooms and you can go to online dating sites and, and you can explore any kind of vile subject that your mind can possibly think of. And teenagers become addicted to video games and they start looking at things like TikTok and Snapchat and, and there's nothing good in none of that. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. There'll be a man or a woman says, boy, you know, I, I really got to get this thing under control. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a fence around it. I'm going to get a blocker. I'm going to have an accountability partner. I'm going to put a screen on it. I, I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to use it only during the day. I'm going to be careful. I'm going to build a fence so that I can keep this dangerous ox in. And all those things are good and proper, and, and you should do that. But did you know that that ox has a way of getting out of that fence? A man who is addicted to pornography pornography will find a way to get around the filter on his computer. He will open a secret account. A teenager will have a private login. 
And here's what I say to you tonight, that if that ox keeps getting out of the fence and if that ox is evident that you cannot control it, you better kill the ox. You say, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine living without a smartphone. Maybe you ought to imagine living without your family and living without your marriage, living without the presence of God, living without a pure mind. I say, if you can't keep it in, then you need to kill it. Because there's nothing wrong with having the ox. But if you can't keep that ox in its proper place, you must kill the ox because the risk of owning the ox is greater than the value of having the ox. Some of you ladies, you have tried and you have tried and you've tried to control social media and you sit and you are addicted to it for hours a day. I do not think it is wrong for you to have social media. I'm not going to say it's a sin for you to have, any, but it can very quickly turn into a sin. And you keep building a fence and setting little rules to keep the ox in. You might just need to go home and kill the ox. Relationships and friends and whatever you have in your life that you cannot keep that's dangerous to you or others, it has to go. I have a lady who used to go to our church and uh, sweet, sweet, precious, precious lady. And she was of a different doctrinal persuasion. She was a little bit more Calvinist than we are and so she moved on to another church, but, but a precious lady. I, I really believe that. Every once in a while, she'll send me an email about every couple of weeks and, Pastor Tim, what about this? And she'll have clippings of whatever's on the news. And it's always, it's always fretting and fear. Yep, yep, yep. Can you believe what the Democrats are doing? Can you believe what the Republicans are doing? Are, 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 are they really, are they, going to, are, are, going to, are they going to mandate the vaccine and are we going to descend into civil war? Are they going to shut the churches down? Here's her problem. She sits and she watches the news every day. You know the best thing she could do is kill the ox. Kill the ox. I was a political junkie, Brother Dave. I, I, was a, I, was, I knew everything about politics and Trump and everybody else, okay? And I mean, I followed. I had, I had all my blogs and I followed it and I read it every day and it didn't help me one bit. But I'm going to tell you, Fox News helped me. Fox News, they blessed my heart. On the night of the election, I got mad. I got mad watching the coverage at about 9 o'clock, turned it off. Since that night, since that night, I have not watched one single minute of cable news or network news. Nowhere, no way, no how, not a one. And I'm still standing. I'm still doing fine. It has helped me spiritually. I don't have as much anxiety and angst about it. I say thank God for that. It was an ox in my life that just needed to die. I don't care if it is sports. I don't care if it is video games. I don't care if it is credit cards. I don't care if it is social media. If it is dangerous to your spirituality and your walk with God and you cannot keep it in, you need to kill the ox. That which cannot be kept must be kept. I'm hurrying because I'm hungry. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, that which is dangerous will become Deadly. You see, everybody knew that this ox was want to push. It simply means he was the kind of ox that's going to get you if you're not careful. Now, not every ox is that way, but this ox is cantankerous. You made sure that you kept your kids away from that ox. You steered clear. In fact, the owner knew. The owner knew that he went in to put the yoke on that ox. He knew, he knew, I got to be careful. Got to be careful of his horns. I got, I, got to make, I, I got to make sure that he's in a strong pen because if this ox gets out, this ox is bad news. You are taking a risk keeping this ox because the potential for harm is very great. And in this story, one day the ox does get loose and the ox does go on a rampage and this ox does gore somebody and the ox does kill somebody. And the ox doesn't care who, young or old, it doesn't matter. But can you imagine somebody coming to this owner somewhere and saying, hey, that ox got out of the pen again. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. And he's down to the neighbors and he's already gorged somebody, some little child. Can you imagine being the owner of that ox, going down to your neighbor, seeing the lifeless body of a little boy or little girl and blood on the ground, and you know that it is your ox that did that, and you are responsible for that death? You see, the principle is that dangerous things will become deadly things. The reason that you must kill the ox is because it's going to kill you. 
I was going to preach tonight on the life of Samson, the strongest physical man, the weakest moral man. He had a fatal attraction to strange women. And the third one finally got him, and that which is dangerous to him became deadly to him. And see, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. See, see we're, we're demanding somebody give me a chapter and verse. Come on, preacher, give me five verses for I can't have this in my life. Give me five verses why I can't go there. Give me five verses why that's wrong. Give me five verses why, why I can't be, I'm not, listen, liberty, liberty in Christ. I, I got liberty in Christ. Hey, we're not talking about liberty tonight. We're talking about trying to get things out of our life that's not good for spiritually. But why don't you and I just be honest and say that there may not be a verse against it, but I got enough sense to know that this is killing my walk with God. I had more of God in my life before this thing was in my life. It is too dangerous to play around with. You play around with dangerous things. Those dangerous things have a way of killing your walk with God and killing the joy of salvation and killing your relationship with your wife and killing your influence with your children and killing your love for the house of God. And you may be still breathing and, and still living, but you're dead to so many things that you used to be alive to because you kept a dangerous ox around. Many of us have weapons in our house. I'm for going under ship. I have guns. guns. I'd never tell you how many guns that I have. But if you're a responsible gun owner, then you know, you know that can become a dangerous weapon. So you take measures. You... you you keep it in a case, you have a trigger lock, you keep the clip and nothing in the chamber, I, whatever it might be. You make sure it doesn't fall into the hands of little children. Surely, surely you wouldn't leave a loaded pistol laying there on the kitchen table, especially if you have children around. Because there have been instances where a child did find a gun, thought it was a toy, and disaster struck. And that'd be a horrible thing. I don't, I don't know how I would live with myself if that ever happened. If one of my kids or grandkids got a hold of a gun, it would probably traumatize me so much. I, I might would just get rid of all of my guns. Just, just too dangerous. I, I don't want to have it in my house anymore. But if it's so dangerous, if you're going to be irresponsible in keeping it, you're better to get rid of it now than to wait something like that happened. I, I'm not against owning guns. I, I own guns. And, and guns in themselves are not dangerous. You understand only the hands of criminals and children. A gun has never shot somebody on its own. It's in the hands of who it is. But the principle is that if you have something dangerous in your life and if you keep it, that thing will become deadly to you. That which cannot be kept must be killed. And that which is dangerous will become deadly. And here's the third principle. That which you can handle will harm others. If you'll notice that this, when this ox got loose, it did not attack its owner because the ox, the owner knew the ox too well. He probably raised it as a calf. He knew its temperament. He knew not to walk behind the ox. He knew when the ox was agitated. He knew not to get too close to the horns. He could handle the ox. I, I can go into the pen with that ox, but you better not. I, I can handle it. Pre preacher, I, preacher, I hear you. I hear you, preacher, but, but I, I can handle this. Preacher, preacher, I, I appreciate the advice, but I, I know what I'm doing, preacher. I, preacher, I know mom, mom and dad said that he wasn't a good boy, but preacher, preacher, I, I, I know. Pre -pre preacher, preacher, don't talk, don't, don't talk. I, I've been handling these kind of situations all of my life. I'm sure that I'm stronger than the ox. That ox may never come after you, but it lulls you into a false sense of security. And all the while that is hurting someone else. See, I'd never watch those shows while the children are up, but I wait till the children go to bed. And after the children are to bed, then we watch HBO and shows with vile things. And you justify it because, you know, I'm an adult. I, I can, not my children. I wouldn't let my children watch this in this language because they're not mature. I, I, I'm mature. And your children never see that. They never see that filth. But they also, it kills any semblance of God in your life as a spiritual daddy. Those children also never hear that daddy pray and they never, they lose the influence of a godly father instead of one that just plays one. Oh, you're handling it. But while you're handling it, it's killing somebody else. There's men, there's men who have kept that porn addiction hid for years and they know it's wrong. But they've succumbed to it for so many years that they finally surrendered to it. But at least I've kept it from everybody else. And that wife may never know, but she also doesn't know why there's no intimacy in the marriage, why the marriage is dead like it is. You handled it. 
but it gored that marriage to death. The danger of the dangerous ox is that it becomes dangerous to somebody else. This owner was never gored by the ox. The ox never attacked him. But in the end, it's going to cost him his life. In the end, it's going to cost him a very high ransom price. And he doesn't get to set the price. The price is going to be set for him. And you think that you could handle it. But what you handle harms others. I wonder tonight if you have an ox in your life that needs to die. If you keep it, it's going to get out one day. It's going to hurt somebody. And if you can't control it, it needs to die. It may not even be wrong to have the ox. But I'm not trying to see how much I can get away with. I'm trying to see how close I can get to Jesus. Hey, Mama. Hey, Daddy. Do you have enough concern for that family to say that that ox in this home is dangerous? I believe that it is detrimental to the spiritual life of our kids. And we're going to kill the ox. A relationship, a hobby, an addiction. The dangerous ox must die. Young adults tonight, I wonder if the Holy Spirit has put his finger tonight on one thing in your life. One person, one thing. And he's brought you here to say that ox has to go. Or I wonder tonight if you'd say, Preacher, there's nothing that I know. But would you come to an altar tonight and say, Lord, this week, would you search my heart? And if this week, if you point out something in my life that ought to die, I'll lay it on the altar. I will not take it back home with me. I'll leave it here. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for the privilege of preaching. What an honor tonight to be able to take your word and to see principles that you've given us. I pray for this church, but I pray for these young adults tonight. I pray that we'd not have the attitude of how much can I get away with. All things are lawful. I've got liberty in Christ. I'm glad that we do. But all oh, help us not to use that liberty as a license to sin. I'm not trying to see how close I can get to the fence. I, I'm trying to see how far away I can get. So I pray that tonight that you would look into our hearts, my heart, and if there's things in our life that are dangerous to our walk with you, would you point it out to us tonight? And would you give us the grace to lay it on the altar and to walk away from it? Have your way in this service, I pray, as pastor's coming, piano's playing. Folks are on the altar. If you need to come, you come tonight. Obey the Lord. Amen. How about we go ahead and stand our feet? So many at the altar already. It doesn't have to be something bad. It could just be something that's deadly. Would you come tonight if God's touched your heart? And you know, young man, young lady, you say, well, I'm not married right now. None of those things apply to me. But they will one day. And maybe if you could get something out of your life now, it'd help you to be able to find that person that God wants you to have. Wouldn't be a danger. Would you come tonight? Oh, my, what a message. Oh. <laughs> Something that might destroy your child's life. No way to undo that.
miss your opportunity. People still at an altar. Just respond.